Evangelical theology places incredible emphasis on the atoning death of the Messiah. He died so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could have eternal life. But what about the resurrection? The Romans crucified countless Jews, but only one was raised to life, suggesting that the resurrection deserves pride of place as the cornerstone of our faith. Messiah Podcast is brought to you by Messiah Magazine, a free publication available in print or online at messiahmagazine.org. Put your hand and mind together. We will walk in harmony. Let me introduce you to my teacher, the rabbi from the Galilee. Welcome to Messiah Podcast Selects. Today we're featuring an article from the most recent issue of Messiah Magazine, written by none other than my co-host, Damian Eisner. How you doing, Damian? I am great. Good to be here. Yeah. Are you excited about reading your own article? Oh, I am. It always helps you. You know, when you when you read your own work, it helps you make it better the next time. So always about improving. I want to do a quick plug for this most recent issue of Messiah Magazine, you should have it. It's getting a lot of positive feedback and not just because of this article that I wrote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of great stuff in there. It's yeah. uh, just go grab it, everybody. Go, you can see it online, you can get a, a, a print copy. It's good stuff. So we're talking uh, today about some, I guess what it would be a controversial sort of article about the crucifixion vis-a-vis the resurrection. Yeah, both important, but uh, as you point out in this article, maybe sometimes we get a little myopic. We don't see their relative importance quite the way the first generation disciples did. Right. And it's there are a lot of reasons for this, which hopefully in our reading and our quick post discussion, we'll bring some of those out and bring some some new light to the subject. All right. Looking forward to it. If you want to know the Jewish Jesus, Don't miss out on a free subscription to Messiah Magazine, where you'll discover his life and teaching, learn about the biblical festivals, and get connected with Israel. Subscribe for free at messiahmagazine.org. Messiah Magazine is a free, donation-supported quarterly publication of First Fruits of Zion. Raised to Life The resurrection is the culmination of the story of Jesus and the cornerstone of our faith. Jesus died. Whether or not one believes he was the Messiah, the fact that he lived and died is a matter of settled history, even among his harshest critics. Evidence certainly indicates that he was a real man, an influencer, a teacher with followers, and a historical figure of great notoriety. Also, yes, he died. Jesus' death holds immense theological significance for every Christian. According to the theology of many Christian traditions on, quote, Good Friday, God gave himself up for creation. In other words, God came to earth in the form of a man named Jesus, willingly suffered and died to take on the sins of humanity so that the high price of low and sinful living would be paid. Hymns of the ages recall the fact that, quote, Jesus paid it all. And behind these cherished melodic declarations, we find the idea of substitutionary atonement. Jesus died so we wouldn't have to. He took our punishment. As a result, we change our inherited fiery downward trajectory and now head straight up to heaven where we'll live forever with Jesus. Notwithstanding the layers upon layers of additional theological constructions explaining the significance of his death, The previous few sentences articulate the understanding of many, many followers of Jesus regarding his entire purpose on earth. Jesus came for one reason, to die for me. Is it any wonder then that the cross receives such a significant amount of attention for billions of Christian followers? 
whether it's Mel Gibson's 2004 film, The Passion of the Christ, the countless artistic portrayals of the crucifixion, or the litany of popular hymns and choruses. Jesus' death and the forgiveness it earned us is, sometimes, the whole story. Let's be very clear. The cross is and must be a core component of our lives as disciples. We should never forget what was accomplished that day and how Jesus emptied himself and humbled himself to the point of death, as Philippians 2.8 reminds us. The cost of our sin was high, and he indeed paid it all on a cross. We all feel some degree of vicarious pain when we see Jesus hanging on that cross. The ideas of the innocent martyr, the selfless hero, the undeserving victim all strike deep chords within us. There's a part in us that needs to meditate on the crucifixion to understand what he did for us. This is why millions of people flocked to the theaters to see Gibson's movie. As the credits rolled, so did the tears from nearly every audience member as they silently shuffled out of the literal and figurative darkness of the theater. We hate injustice. Jesus did all those miracles. He lived such a great life. There was no one quite like him, and he didn't deserve the cross. This is all completely true. However, there is a problem we must consider. For too many people, the necessary awareness and gratitude for the cross have such outsized importance that they miss the rest of the story. The cross is only the beginning. It's an essential part of the story, but we miss the point if we stop there without moving on to the story's triumphant culmination. It's important to remember that death by gruesome crucifixion was not out of the ordinary in Israel. For many Jews, life ended on a cross. There were many heroes, martyrs, and innocent victims taken by the cruel, torturous hands of Roman soldiers. Some of them were criminals deserving of death, but many were good people who died unnecessarily and unjustly. Remember also that there were other Jewish miracle workers performing healings, multiplying foodstuffs, and even bringing people back to life. Elijah and Elisha are two examples from the Hebrew scriptures. Death on a cross, miracles, and even messianic claims, these are not unique in Judaism. However, Jesus is unique in one specific way. He came back from the dead. Though this fact receives approximately one minute and 30 seconds of attention in the Passion of the Christ, it was that moment that truly transformed the world. That moment that fueled the joy and passion that daily animates the life of every disciple of Yeshua. That miracle reconfirmed the good news. The kingdom had indeed drawn near. Professor Paula Fredrickson writes, two of the prime promises of the Messianic age, the resurrection of the dead and the vindication of the righteous had been realized. When Jesus came back from the dead, the cross, as important as it was, was overshadowed by the resurrection, the culmination of Jesus' mission and the assurance of salvation and redemption. Only at the resurrection was the hope of humanity solidified. Jesus rose, and through that resurrection, God confirmed to an incredibly diverse and divided Jewish community in Jerusalem that the kingdom of God was indeed among them. He placed his seal of approval on the teaching of the Pharisees, for they taught that the resurrection of the dead was real. He silenced the Sadducees. There will be a real, visible, tangible, corporeal resurrection of our bodies after we die. Just as the prophets had promised, Jesus' resurrection, unlike the crucifixion, was an unequivocal sign from God. It was the resurrection, not the crucifixion, that truly inaugurated the kingdom and guaranteed our destiny. There can be no kingdom without the resurrection, for there would be no king. The hope of the world to come hinges on Jesus' resurrection. Paul often wrote of the cross but he knew the rest of the story centered on the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, he writes, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. 
Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. Jesus died. We remember and honor it. We do it in accordance with his instruction in the Gospels. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Luke 22. Every Passover, the recollection of the cross and the death of our Messiah flood our hearts and minds with feelings of humility, gratitude, and even sadness. This is as it should be for that moment. The crucifixion is a critical part of the story of salvation, both historically and theologically. Without it, there would be no forgiveness of sins. Without it, the nations would not be able to enter the congregation of Israel. Most importantly, however, without the crucifixion, there would be no resurrection. And the resurrection is the true pinnacle of Jesus' saving work. This is why we must not remain weeping at the foot of the cross. We must instead understand that the cross paved the way for the resurrection, for the hope of the glorious messianic age that is coming. The disciples took that calling seriously. Just as Jesus was resurrected in the flesh, so would they be. The kingdom was real, and the good news was really good. So they put their hands to the plow, not looking back, and set about the work of preparing for the kingdom's arrival. They came looking for his body and heard these words. Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Our hope is not at the foot of the cross where Jesus died. Our hope is at the empty tomb where Jesus rose from the dead. You can get a free subscription to Messiah Magazine at messiahmagazine.org. Messiah Magazine is where you'll get meaningful teaching on the roots of your faith, the biblical festivals, Israel, and most of all, you'll discover the Jewish Jesus through a Messianic Jewish perspective. Subscribe for free today at messiahmagazine.org. Messiah Magazine is a free donation-supported quarterly publication of First Fruits of Zion. Well, what a fantastic article about the resurrection and a great reminder. However, as somebody who grew up in church and, um, you know, I, I'm still in church. I'm in, I, I, I'm a, I lead the music for an evangelical church. Like that's, yeah. that's where I live. That's where I operate. And all of my curriculum, my school curriculum growing up was independent fundamental Baptist. And, you know, the cornerstone of all the teaching about salvation was penal substitutionary atonement. Mm -hmm. It was all about penal substitutionary atonement to the point where there were times when I wondered, like, am I saved by Jesus dying on the cross or am I saved because I believe in penal substitutionary atonement? <laughs> like, that, it seemed like that was really the important thing to get your theology of salvation right. So right. I can, I, I know there's people out there who are, who are saying, well, hold on a second. It sounds like you're saying that, that there's something that's, more important than penal substitutionary atonement. So um, what do you say to someone who, who's maybe caught off guard by this slight uh, reprioritization of theological ideas? Well, first of all, I understand it. Um, this, is, this is very, very sacred ground. And it's also really important to, to clarify something that I didn't get into in the article, which is I also totally understand that, that the Christian celebration of Easter certainly brings a great amount of focus to the resurrection. I mean, that is that is the holiday, right? Yeah. Um, but, but what you're saying is also incredibly, incredibly prevalent. Like, you know, staying at the foot of the cross, like just always remembering. And, and I am in no way, not at all, never, ever minimizing that. Um, I, I, but, you know, I think it's difficult to define relative importance between death and resurrection, between mm. crucifixion and resurrection. They're integral. They're connected components. But 
Now, like, like quoting Paula Fredrickson in the article, only at the resurrection was the hope of humanity solidified. And I guess it sort of comes down to defining what the hope of humanity is. Mm. That's a that's a pretty important thing because there's this perspective that says, believe in Jesus, go to heaven, end of story, right? Yeah. You know, live, live in glory with Jesus forever, or at least until the new Jerusalem comes down and we'll have this angelic spiritual body of some sort and float about with harps and with angels. But, but, but there's a biblical perspective that's quite a bit different and we know it clearly as the kingdom perspective a thousand year reign of the messiah on earth a restored improved planet the realization of the prophetic declarations in the old testament the tanakh a real place with a with a king in jerusalem the messiah yeshua a house of prayer for all nations glorious peace and harmony and all those things about lambs and lions and kids sticking their hands in serpent holes and all the things, you know, it's like it, uh, harmony, God's word written on our hearts, all of this happening in a resurrected body, a tangible, restored, back to life, perfected body with which we enjoy it all. And I think that is the hope of resurrection, that we enter the kingdom of God and he wants you there. Um, but so as to make certain that we're not minimizing the crucifixion and anything that we're saying, it's also equally balanced to say you can't get there on your own. And, and mm. there's the importance, the irreplaceable importance of the blood of the Redeemer. Uh, because nothing could stand in the presence of God without purification. We read in Exodus about Moses sprinkling blood on the elements of divine service, the tabernacle and the vessels. You know, the the what we would perceive as inanimate objects yeah. are still sprinkled. And why? They're purified for the service of God, hmm. able to be in the very presence of the Holy One. And And then, as I sort of ramble on, but let me make this really important point, there's the covenant conversation that's related to blood. And I, I think this gets missed way too often. We read about Moses, again, Exodus, purifying the book of the covenant and all of the people. How? With blood. This is the blood of the covenant. They too are set apart for service to God. And so it makes it all the more powerful when we're thinking about the Passover Seder and Yeshua taking up this cup and saying, this is my blood of the covenant where we're set apart for service to God, covered by the blood, able to eventually stand in the presence of God. And how are we going to do that? We're going to do that with resurrected bodies purified by the blood. And the kingdom of God lives under that new covenant that the shedding of Yeshua's blood inaugurated. It was the seal of that covenant. Our blood could never do that. So to suggest that the minimization of the work on the cross is what's happening here, I mean, in absolutely no way, that's a stretch. But I do think, if I might humbly suggest that Messianic Judaism sees this through a different and more biblical lens hmm. kingdom covenant future on earth and eventually eternal glory with god in the world to come and i think just a lot of people have never been taught to think in those terms but they see it more in the jonathan edwards way sinners in the hands of an angry god you know we're despicable creatures damned by default as daniel lancaster says created for destruction that this hostile and hateful god must be pacified with blood someone had to pay the price the ransom and here's your term jacob the penal substitution or whatever yeah. theory you might like to name it yeah, it's interesting to me that um, that eschatology or the uh, theology of the end times plays a role here in in how we think about the crucifixion and the resurrection. Yeah. When you really believe in a literal kingdom, a, a literal kingdom, you know this is what uh, what the what they would call millennial millennialism, right? Mm -hmm. We're not amillennial; we're 
we're millennial. We believe that that uh, Jesus is going to come and reign in real life, like not just up in heaven, but he's going to come back and this is going to be a, a physical reality. You know, growing up, it was always sort of a, well, pick which one you like, pre-millennial, post-millennial, amillennial, pre-tribulation, right. mid-tribulation, <laughs> you know, all these options. It was sort of like a buffet table and you just pick the, your favorite one, but it didn't, you know, it didn't seem to have that big of an impact on the rest of your theology. But the way you've explained it, it kind of does. If you don't believe in a literal kingdom, then well, these ideas don't relate to each other in quite the same way. Right. And, you know, I, I'm a millennial. I, all, all of the different camps that we have, you know, everyone has a camp, it seems, and yeah. thinking these things. But I remember, I'm a millennial, you know, the idea that the kingdom is, is, uh, that there isn't going to be one, right? Or there's no mm -hmm. thousand year or, or correct me if I'm wrong, but like we're in the kingdom. The kingdom started with Jesus. Uh, mm. Is is that uh, is that an accurate statement for an oh, amillennial belief? You'd have to ask an amillennial. I didn't get a lot of exposure to amillennial because I was getting all this filtered through people who who thought that amillennialism was uh, was heresy. So they right, right. Uh, well, the the thing I would say that's heretical about it is again something I heard Aaron Evie say, which is if this is the kingdom. If, if, if we're talking, if we're recording this podcast in the kingdom, I want my money back. Yeah. Yeah. I was listening to a guy, um, out of, out of Coeur d'Alene a long time ago. And he, the way he put it was, um, if Satan is bound in chains, then his leash is way too long. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. So right. Doesn't well, seem I mean, quite right. Understanding the, understanding the crucifixion in, in terms of, the kingdom. Here's what yeah. I would say. I, yeah, I, I would echo Yeshua's words, I think, and say that the crucifixion is the door. The, right. The, the The resurrection is 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 the stepping into a new and glorious space created by God for His children. It's not here yet. I understand that. There's there's a coming kingdom, and I think you and I could have a have an all day conversation about why it wasn't realized back then yeah but but it's an it's an the end point of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven yeah yeah the door is important because without the door you can't get where you're going but really you don't you don't just stand there in the doorway the, the important right. thing is to get there it's to get to this this uh, glorious future this kingdom that we all anticipate I was thinking about this too, because the kingdom, you know, the kingdom idea intersects with the individual, right? But when it does, when you look at the gospels, for example, and, and, and Yeshua will say to someone, oh, you're not far from the kingdom, right? Yeah. Um, the kingdom intersects with an individual based on whether they are part of it or not. But I think that we can make the error of focusing a lot on ourselves like really just thinking oh jesus died for my sins i've even heard people say even if you were the only one you know if you were the only sinner or if you were the only one who ever accepted him he still would have died like just for you mm -hmm. and it becomes and i'm not going to say whether that's true or not for sure it is but um that's not really uh, what we see in the gospels we don't see that individualist kind of perspective this idea of the kingdom it's it's all of israel and then spreading to the whole world. I mean, God yeah. wants to redeem all of creation. It's it's not, you know, so the the, the microscope is not on really looking at, at an individual person all the time in, in the in the in the gospel presentation of the kingdom message, right? Right. Well, you used the word myopic earlier. I spent a good bit of a portion of my adult working life working in the laser vision correction world oh, right. myopic myopia nearsighted seeing thing not getting the big picture that's what that means the kingdom is the big picture and that's what god did through yeshua and in addition to what he did for the individual i mean he he started the repair of this broken world yeshua inaugurated a new covenant like we were talking about and when we step through that door when he says, I am the way, when he says, I am the door, we become 
citizens of heaven. What does that mean? Is that like floating, you know, floating with little fat babies with wings and harps? Gosh, I hope not. <laughs> terrifying they're very cute i've seen them in much much a lot of artwork it's the it's the kingdom of god uh the the new covenant thing right here on the world but in the world and i again i'm going back to never minimizing what you're talking about the forgiveness of sins or the individual restoration that yeshua accomplished but it is so much bigger than that that yeah. is that is that is myopia yeah. and it's it's that's a hard lesson because it just doesn't get discussed very often and part of that is israel part of it is the word that you hear first fruits of zion talk about all the time two words actually replacement theology mm. or one word supersessionism absolutely um, the idea that and and again i'm talking to i'm i'm in a roundabout way getting to your question when you talked about the big picture is god kingdom israel restoration of the world all that stuff but the idea that god would write israel out of the story that he replaced israel with the church there uh, you know how many proof texts are given to support that but but on the most basic level, the, the the greatest objection I think that anyone should ever have to replacement theology is quite, quite simple. If God changes the plan, if he writes all this great stuff about Israel and then changes his mind that easily, and now that he likes the church better than Israel, why can't he just flip-flop on that later? Yeah. It, it's, it's scary to think no, of it is. A, an arbitrary god versus a god we can trust to say what he means yeah yeah i think i've told people in the in the past like if if god can do that if god can say well we're this is uh not this anymore here's the here's the new thing everybody right. get on board the new train if you're still on the old train you're gonna be in trouble well then we really need to take a look at this muhammad guy because i recall him saying something sort of similar maybe it did happen <laughs> again you know uh, if it can happen, now you're it can getting heretical twice. jacob yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't think that we should, but <laughs> that's know, a, you might I get understand. there from replacement theology, right? right. Yeah, so uh, you right. got to be careful with this replacement theology. I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it. And and to your second point, if we talked a lot about the kingdom perspective, but I mean, it's very easy to remove the kingdom from the story when the story is only about me. Jesus died for me, 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 yeah. I. I'm always intrigued by. Um, and I just don't want to sound critical here, but I'm, I'm always intrigued is a polite word for what I'm really feeling when I listen to so much of the music that's out there today, hmm. that it is nothing but me, I, me, 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 me. And, and that's, but, but why is that? It's because that's the story that that everyone's been told for two thousand years. What yeah. happens, you know? It, you take the kingdom out. What what is left other than me? What happens when I die? Heaven or hell? Well, yeah. and that that's not the story. We know Yeshua. He doesn't have a whole lot to say about heaven and hell. The the Torah is you know, a virtually silent, the Bible speaks very little about that. And, you know, but, but regarding the individual, I teach my kids when someone opens the door, well, I taught them, they're much older now, but I hope they learned that when someone opens the door, you say, thank you. Mm. You know, when you, when, especially when they open a door that you could never open yourself, Hmm. like Yeshua, when they let you into a restricted place. I love concerts. When someone lets you backstage and you, you meet the big dog or the band, you know, the kingdom, <laughs> the kingdom is the ultimate backstage pass being in the presence of God, living under the perfection of Messiah's rule, the practice of the perfect Torah. And I read this book called Yeshua matters one time. Ooh. by a guy named Jacob Franzak. I know that guy. The gleaming bright future that God promised through the Old Testament prophets. That's backstage, man. And that's the door that Yeshua 
opened. Hmm. So, so it's quite a bit bigger than me. The whole world is invited and yeah. Well, there's a, there's a tragedy here in American Christianity in its history that people might not be aware of because about a hundred years ago, the church in America split and, um, about, you know, uh, you know, all the denominations on this side of the split said, um, well, we're not too keen on all these supernatural stuff, but we're going to take all the things we like from the gospels, like caring for the poor and feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, homes for the homeless. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to run with that because, uh, you know, this whole thing of saving the soul, we're not sure about anymore. And the other half, the, you know, the rest of the Christians said, no, we have to have the supernatural. If Jesus didn't come back from the dead, none of this means anything. But because this is what happens when groups sort of fight over the same definitions or when groups sort of split and both of them say they're the original one and the good one, um, the people who believed in the resurrection, they stopped talking about uh, some of this other kingdom stuff like right. Uh, feeding the poor and clothing the naked and visiting prisoners and these things that we see in the gospels. I think it, it's a real tragedy that, um, that we had, that we had this split to begin with, but certainly that the people who believed in the resurrection started downplaying what they called the, the social gospel. I mean, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if someone's hungry or not. What, what matters is if they're going to heaven when they die. Well, the right. kingdom, the kingdom extends everywhere. And maybe the first encounter someone has with the kingdom is a believer in Yeshua giving you bread when you're hungry. And that is something that draws you closer to God. And um, I really just wish that we would have kept some of that stuff and, and instead of letting other people have it. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And and that's just one quick addition to that um, kingdom-minded perspective that Yeshua was constantly encouraging people to have. I mean, clearly there was a sense of imminence that the kingdom was indeed on the brink of arrival, right? But but every day was an opportunity to demonstrate the kingdom, not, you know, like be thinking about going to heaven. Hmm. It it was about taking the gift you received, being able to walk in the door of of salvation and into a greater a greater future. But most certainly, the the um gift that yeshua gave was for us to now demonstrate on earth uh, what the kingdom was going to look like when it came to earth that's a key component to remember yeah and that since i think the new testament is is you know a lot like the old testament it's very practical it's mostly concerned with what we're supposed to be doing right now we trust mm -hmm. god for the future we have faith in his promise um, but our job right now is to bring the kingdom into reality in whatever way we can in our circumstances. And I think yep. it's okay to, to, to focus on that, knowing that our future is secure because of the work of our master. Yep. Now, there's one more question I had just for maybe some of our listeners who might have been surprised about what you said about the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Because again, when I grew up, the Sadducees were the bad guys and the Pharisees were also the bad guys but you distinguished between them. So for our listeners that uh, haven't heard this yet or maybe aren't as aware of the first century context, why would the resurrection of the master silence the Sadducees but vindicate the Pharisees? Aren't, aren't the Pharisees the bad guys? Why would we want to prove them correct about something? What was the difference between these two groups for our more novice listeners here? And, and, and how come the, maybe the Pharisees aren't uh, quite what we would expect? I can't remember which dictionary I looked it up in, but Pharisee is absolutely the synonym of hypocrisy, right? That's its, that's its common usage. Yeah, that's how we use the term today. Sadly, historically, when you understand the culture in which Yeshua was living, teaching, inspiring, the Pharisees were the people's people. I mean, they, they, were, they were examples. Um, clearly there are hypocritical religious leaders. I know that could never happen today, right? But, you know, <laughs> back then, back then. No, of course. And, and so, yeah, you, you point, the fact that he didn't commend thousands of Pharisees throughout the gospel pages 
is because it was, you know, sort of an assumption that there were a lot of very, very good Pharisees, but you call out because like managing by exception is a management term. Mm -hmm. As long as everything's going good, I don't talk to you. But if I see you do something bad, I'm going to call you out. And we see Yeshua doing that in some instances in the Gospels. But overall, the Pharisees, we we believe like the Pharisees. We believe in an actual coming kingdom. We believe in, you know, judgment of the of the righteous and the wicked. We believe, most importantly, in, in accordance with Pharisaic theology, in a resurrection of the dead, hmm. which the Sadducees did not. Yeah. And so, you know, remember in Acts 23, Paul is is before this council perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, brethren, I am a Pharisee. Who knew that about Paul? Yeah. <laughs> Present tense, a son of Pharisees. I'm on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. So when Hashem, when God resurrected Yeshua and he became the first fruits from the dead, the Sadducees had no leg to stand on. The hmm. Pharisees, who had taught all of the people how you live matters. It's more than just this life. It's more than just you know money and status and, and how the world sees you. God is watching you, and, and there's going to be a resurrection. And all of a sudden, here it is, three days after the crucifixion. And the Pharisees were proved right. So there's a there's a lot behind the history of the Pharisees, but that was a big deal for them. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't know that Paul was a ride or die Pharisee to the end of his life. <laughs> yeah, he kept that's it a good going. One. Yeah, right. So, um, it's but speaking of Paul, I want to mention one other thing that I remembered as we're talking. Sure, um, Paul. Uh, the, uh, so much about what we've talked about here, and what we always talk about is the kingdom. That's sort of our thing at hmm. first roots of zion well because it was yeshua's thing i think we we stand in pretty good company but it was also paul's thing toward the end of acts well at the end it says that paul stayed where he was stayed uh two full years in his own rented lodging and welcomed all who came to him and what was he preaching how to go to heaven when you die or you know it says preaching the kingdom of god yeah and teaching the things about the lord jesus christ with all openness unhindered hmm. i hope that's what we're doing here yeah that's i mean it's really his uh, footsteps were following it and the apostles footsteps and the messiah's footsteps and the and the message was consistent from the first chapter of the of uh, Mark, you know, or I think Matthew, it doesn't show up for a couple chapters because we get some background, but this kingdom idea, first to last page of the New Testament, man. I mean, it's the it's really foundational as a concept and, and recognizing that I think is key in recognizing that the resurrection is how God told us, hey, this, uh, your king is alive and this yeah. kingdom is real and it is coming and it's here today in some form. Absolutely. Well, man, thanks for reading this article for us. I enjoyed it. Thanks for uh, having this conversation with us. Ah, my pleasure. I, I think we, I think we um, walked across this potential theological minefield with care and concern for all of the theologies and ideas that are that are represented when we talk about the crucifixion. It is such an such an important thing. But again, you know. It's, it's what comes next. It's walking through that doorway that has mm. been provided through Yeshua and into the glory of what's coming next. Well said. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Messiah Podcast, where Jesus is Jewish and that changes everything. This podcast is an extension of Messiah Magazine, available at messiahmagazine.org. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a review along with a five-star rating wherever you're listening now. 
Today's podcast was hosted by myself, Jacob Franzak, along with Damian Eisner. Our executive producer is Boaz Michael, and the editor-in-chief is Daniel Lancaster. This episode was directed and edited by Jeremy Schoenwald. Original music was written and performed by Joshua Aaron. The show notes for Messiah Podcast were edited by Candy Bishop and are available at messiahpodcast.org. If you are interested in learning more about the Bible from a Messianic Jewish perspective, check out Torah Club, which is an international network of small study groups who meet weekly to study the Bible together from a Messianic Jewish perspective. To start a club or join a club, go to TorahClub.org. Until next time, Shalom. Let his word cover you and me Like the waters cover the sea Let his love cover you and me Like the waters cover the sea